I'm John Mutter. As is described here, I have the title of the director of the postdoc program, but it's really directed by Natalie and Sam, who do most of the work, and I take all the glory from it. Uh, we, met, we have these uh, symposia twice a year, uh, spring and the fall, and the idea is to try to showcase um, the postdocs who are uh, having their tenure, two-year tenure at uh, the Earth Institute. <coughs> they work in many, many different fields. You'll see this soon. We have no narrow specified area in which we want people to work. Uh, we'd like to see a broad range of subjects all somehow rotating around the ideas of sustainable development, but we don't want to channel people. Uh, that means that the postdocs will be found all over Colombia and up at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, uh, and that's part of the intent. <coughs> um, um, so if you uh, would like to join the program and talk to me about it, and I'll tell you how the procedure goes. Um, uh, we've been doing this for many years now, uh, refining the program, uh, thinking about how to make it work best. In most instances, uh, the postdoc will work with a, uh, uh, a faculty member at the university. It's not absolutely always the case, but mostly it's the case. And in order for, to have to be well advised, uh, a postdoc is a time when it's the last time when you're going to have any freedom. It's the last time you're going to have any freedom if you go into an academic position. You can teach, but you don't have to. You don't have to go to faculty meetings. You don't have to go to any meetings if you don't want to. From now on, you're going to be burdened with all of that junk if you, uh, if you go to, on to be an academic. Um, so think about this as a time to spread your wings, to do something that maybe your dissertation advisor wouldn't have wanted you to do. So to help with that person, spread your wings, do something new and interesting, and um, we're very happy to have you here. First speaker is Marin Greenleaf, who is going to speak on the untenured forest, land, labor, and new environmental value in the Brazilian Amazon. So my name is Marin Greenleaf. I'm a sociocultural and environmental anthropologist and legal scholar. Um, so my research is primarily qualitative and ethnographic. Today I'm going to present work from two papers I've been working on this year. Both focus on a state program in the Brazilian state of Acre called the State System of Incentives for Environmental Services, or CISA, which seeks to give monetary value to the carbon sequestered in Acre's Amazonian rainforest. CISA is considered um, one of the most advanced programs to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, or RED, plus an uh, acronym a lot of you are probably familiar with. Um, it's developed in international policy and scientific discussions around the UNFCCC negotiations. And since about the mid-2000s, RED projects have proliferated in tropical forests around the world. And their environmental, political, and social dynamics and effects are not well understood still. So my research here examines the political and social dynamics of CISA. And it's based on extended field work I did in Acre in 2012 through 2014, um, data from which I'm still analyzing. Um, the field work consisted of a qu quantitative qualitative survey of about 240 smallholder farmers that I did with the Center for International Forestry Research. Um, about 100 in-depth interviews with rural people, government officials, and others working to reduce deforestation in Acre, and participant observation in government offices of agricultural extension work and of daily urban and rural life in Acre. So before I get into my analysis, I just want to tell you a little bit more about the state of Acre. Um, it's in the Amazon right next to Peru and Bolivia. Uh, it's quite remote far from the population and economic and political centers of Brazil, which are along the coast and in the south. It's one of the poorest states of the Amazon and one of, uh, of, the, of Brazil overall, uh, and one of the smallest. There's only about 800,000 people who live there, and it's about 86% forested. 
still. Caesar's monetization of carbon is not the first time that Acre's living forest has had financial value. The area was colonized by Brazilians and annexed by Brazil during the late 1800s and early 1900s entirely because of its high density of rubber trees, like the ones you see pictured here. So you can see um, the grooves that rubber tappers cut, carved into the tree to um, get latex to trickle down and they'd collect it in a cup at the bottom. So collecting rubber from living native rubber trees has been central to Acreano history and identity. In contrast, in many parts of the world, um, rubber trees are cut down in order to collect rubber, or increasingly, they're um, grown in plantations. <clears throat> so the effort to make the living forest monetarily valuable once more through carbon makes some cultural sense in Acre. And this is because of the imprint of rubber production that remains strong in the state. Most Acreanos today are descendants of rubber tappers, and many, like this gentleman here, uh, tapped rubber in their youth. Acreano rubber tappers organized in an internationally celebrated social movement in the 1980s when cattle ranchers moved to the region at the behest of the military dictatorship. The ranchers engaged in extensive deforestation and evicted and killed resident rubber tappers and indigenous people. And the forest has been celebrated by the left of center government that was connect that's connected to the rubber tap movement and that has governed in the state since 1999. It adopted forest protection policies and built up a professional environmental administration. Here you see a bit of how the government, which is self-titled the government of the forest, you can't quite see the that down there, but that's the, the logo. Um, so the government of the forest, and it's emblazoned on buildings throughout the capital. Um, on the left, you see uh, the historic center of the city, which is now called the Forest People's Plaza. And on the right, you see uh, a sign announcing the city's free Wi-Fi, which is called the Digital Forest. This history of forest identity, forest protection, and environmental governance has enabled the Acreano government to develop CISA and is part of what makes the program so respected internationally. But despite the emphasis on forest protection, there is significant deforestation in Acre, as you see pictured here. So on the left, you see uh, an example of the type of deforestation that large landholders tend to practice. It's large in scale um, and it's permanent, so they don't let forests return. They let a few, the, the trees you see remaining are um, probably Brazil nut trees, which have some financial value and they, they let them, they're legally required to let them stand. And you might be able to make out a few cattle um, grazing there, so they, they, it's very extensive, the type of cattle ranching they do. There's only one or two head of um, cattle per hectare. <coughs> So this kind of deforestation is responsible, or this, this is the majority of deforestation that happens in Acre, and in most parts of the Amazon, it's also uh, very important. On the right, you see um, deforestation done by smallholder farmers. Um, <clears throat> so they, they cut and burn just small sections of the forest, one or two hectares, and burn it to fertilize the soil to let them um, grow crops there for just a few years, and then they let the forest return in a form of Sweden agriculture. This type of deforestation is not responsible for most deforestation in Acre or the Amazon overall, but it is increasingly important um, because smallholders are being integrated into the cattle industry. So increasingly, instead of letting forest return to those areas, they're just turning it into pasture and keeping it uh, cleared. <clears throat> so this graphic shows deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon from 1988, which is when monitoring began, through 2016. And Acre's trends tend to follow that of the Amazon overall. So what one thing that you'll notice is there's a precipitous drop starting in the mid-2000s, and then the deforestation rate tends to, it starts to climb again in recent years. So the issue that CISA and other programs are trying to tackle is how to keep the rates down. So a little bit more about CISA now. Um, it was developed by governmental and non-governmental actors in the late 2000s and adopted by the Acreano State Legislature in 2010. 
It creates a framework for the monetization of many ecosystem services, which you see listed here. And uh, carbon sequestration is the first of these programs to be developed, and the only one with serious potential for external financial support. Through CISA, the Ocreano State sells carbon credits, representing reductions in deforestation emissions. And the number of credits is determined by subtracting actual emissions from a, quote, business as usual baseline. This is kind of a standard carbon market calculation. Red credits are currently not accepted into any compliance carbon market, but Acre has managed to make some real money off of its reductions in carbon emissions, including um, 55 million euros worth in credit sales to European institutions and governments. <coughs> And it's the most likely source, Acre is the most likely source of red credits into the very important California carbon market based on a 2010 MOU between the two governments. And the California Air Resources Board is currently deliberating over whether or not to let those, car those credits into the market. So the focus of my first paper is on the distribution of carbon benefits and its relationship to land and labor. So mainstream red thinking holds that clear land tenure is a prerequisite for the payment for ecosystem services approach that underlies many RID programs, which is basically that you pay people to stop deforesting. So just as an example, um, the quotation you see up here, the exclusiveness of rights to the land providing the ecosystem service is a fundamental precondition of payment for ecosystem services. The problem is that in Acre, and in most parts of the world with tropical forests, many rural people, especially the poor, lack formal land rights. In Brazil, many people, including the woman you see pictured here, um, live legally on their land because the law recognizes that land rights vest through occupation. But they also live informally because Brazilian law also doesn't give them a way to an accessible way to get formal land tenure. There is also extensive land conflicts um, and conflicting land claims and very extensive land fraud uh, throughout the, the country. And this complicates any tenure reform efforts. For much of Brazilian history, this confusion around land tenure has actually functioned as what the anthropologist James Holston calls a, quote, strategy of rule for a distant central government over its vast territory. So making clear tenure a prerequisite would spell doom for red, CISA developers told me. As one put it to me, we are in Latin America. When discussing a European model or an American model, you have centuries and centuries of structuring and regular regularization, uh, regulation sorry, of property rights. And you fortunately succeeded in Europe to title property. Here you do not have it. So if you follow a path in Latin America applying European models of the conception of title, you will never be able to do emissions reductions or carbon programs linked to the land because you need to solve an earlier problem, which is the problem of titles. Nor in the next 100 years, unfortunately, will we be able to do this. So I argue that CISA violates red orthodoxy that land hold, landholders and landowners in particular need to be paid. Instead, it sidesteps the morass of tenure, I found, in a way that allows it to redistribute forest carbon revenue to those without land rights. It takes what is, it takes what is known as a jurisdictional approach to red. It makes the entire state into a red program. And this allows the state to detach forest carbon's value from land. Land ownership and the location where deforestation happens or doesn't happen does not determine benefit distribution. Instead of paying landowners to deforest less, CISA gives rural people, quote, incentives, which is the I in CISA, um, to produce more from already cleared fields and from forests. Thus, it shifts forest carbon's new monetary value from land to another factor of production, labor. So here you see some examples of the incentives that, um, that CISA funds and that I studied. Um, the first one is distribution of macuna, which is a nitrogen-fixing legume, and the use of which can allow smallholders to keep using the same plot of land for many more years instead of deforesting new plots. Uh, the government con has, has constructed and continues to construct thousands of 
um, fish farm, fish ponds on smallholders' property in the effort to, to spur a, a local industrial fish farming uh, complex. It supports acai berry collection, and this is an, an example of the effort to spur production from forests as opposed to, to fields, um, because acai trees uh, grow within the forest, and that's what's in those, those bags there. Um, it supports intensified cattle ranching, um, so trying to increase the number of cattle supported on each hectare of land. And it supports the raising of um, small animals like chickens through the distribution of chicks and the construction of chicken coops. So all of these seek to get rural people to intensify their land use, producing higher yields from forests and fields. This approach draws from dominant but controversial thinking um, called land sparing. And it does so in a way that redistributes carbon revenue to poor rural people, many of whom would be excluded if land rights were required. Thus, it uses the monetization of carbon, which is critiqued often as a, a neoliberal policy linked to the concentration of wealth and the evisceration of the state, to an expansion of state social welfare, welfare provision and a redistribution premised on environmental ends. It is, I argue, a form of what geographer Susanna Hecht has called tropical Keynesianism. Okay, so I'll end by talking briefly about a second paper I am finishing up now, and it looks at the way that CISA includes rural, rural poor people. And I use ethnographic analysis of interactions between agricultural extension workers like this man in the foreground of the photo, uh, and with poor farmers like the man behind him. And I argue that while CISA uh, includes poor farmers, in part by moving forest carbon's value from land to labor, that inclusion is precarious. It is not based on rights. Rural people have no rights to forest carbon revenue. In fact, CISA's jurisdictional approach is an implicit claim of the state's ownership of forest carbon. According to CISA's found, founding legislation, rural people have to be recognized by the state as, quote, legitimate and, quote, be integrated into its programs in order to receive CISA benefits. And this gives the state tremendous discretion to decide who should receive incentives, who should benefit from forest carbon, and who should not. Moreover, this approach allows the state to enact a vision of inclusion as temporary. Incentives are not meant to be ongoing payments for not deforesting. Rather, they are supposed to make rural people into productive, entrepreneurial, low-carbon farmers who are independent of state support. And I show that this entails poor rural people who already live a tenuous existence taking on a lot of new forms of risk. Thus, CISA joins a long and troubled history of policies that seek to change the way poor rural Sweden practitioners produce in ways that increase their vulnerability and without giving them rights to their land. So thank you very much. And unfortunately, I can't um, stay to take questions. But if, if anyone has any questions or comments, please get in touch with me. Thank you.